No mai, hara mai te iwi, and welcome to this evening's Centre for Health, Hauera Korero. Ko Nat Hilton Manohau, nō Taranga Moana e noho ana. Kia ora everyone, I'm Nat, and I'll be facilitating our Hauera Korero tonight on mental health. Are you stressed, anxious, burnt out? Are you working too hard, not seeing your whānau enough? You have no balance or you've experienced trauma and need a little help? Tonight, we're very fortunate to have a couple of amazing advocates of mental health who'll be sharing their experiences with you, our whānau at home. So settle in, take a few deep breaths, and we'll get into it. And hopefully you'll be able to get some insights or strategies to help you and support you on your ongoing mental wellbeing. Before I introduce our amazing panel, I'd like to introduce, um, uh, invite our clinical director, Anna Rolleston, to open up our korero with the whakatauki. Kia ora, Anna. Kia ora, Nat. Tēnā koutou katoa, nā mahi mahana, kia koutou. Thanks everyone who's out there, um, who's joining the session tonight, and for those of you who are going to watch it maybe later on this week. Um, we usually start these hauora korero with either a karakia or a whakatauki. Um, depending on the topic, and we thought we'd use a whakatauki tonight. And that whakatauki comes from um, Hine Moa Elder's book of um, proverbs called Aroha. And so this whakatauki goes, He au kei uta e taia te karo, he au kei te moana e kore te taia. And what that means is you may dodge smoke on land, but you cannot dodge the current at sea. And what that means is it's about, um, it's a proverb about learning to spot danger. And with regard to this quarter all that we're having tonight, it's about this idea that uh, there are always little signs that we're heading down a pathway that might not be the best for us. And in terms of our mental health, um, there are often little triggers that we know that if we don't acknowledge those things, then we spiral downwards. And so that's kind of the direction for the corridor or tonight is um, we're hopefully going to provide you with some ideas about picking up on those signs or those tohu that happen on the daily kind of thing where they make you stop and think about what's happening at this point in time. So kia ora everyone. Thanks for coming. Oh, kia ora Anna. And thank you for opening up that, that insightful whakatauki. Um, So what we'll do now is we'll just go around and we'll introduce the rest of our panel. Um, I'll ask Hannah. Hannah, did you want to introduce yourself to our whanau at home, please? Mm -hmm. uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah. Um, I'm a clinical exercise physiologist and uh, clinic manager here at the Centre for Health. Um, so I get the privilege of working with people through predominantly uh, their physical um, ailments or trying to improve their physical self um, but equally acknowledging the role that the mental health plays on that um, aspect as well so yeah really looking forward to this quarter job tonight thanks Dan. Kia ora Hannah. Oh, and our Te Arawa Princess Fire June would you like to introduce yourself please? Oh kia ora, kia ora koutou ngā mihi mahana uh, ko June Grand Ho mai makatū ki tongarero. Um, I I live and work in this um, this rohe of um, Rotorua. I work in a well women's area, so I work as a payata here for breast and cervical screening and supporting women to those screenings. Kia ora fire. Spencer, our prince tonight, our, our, our po. Do you want to introduce yourself, please? Oh, kia ora tato. Uh... Ko uh, Spencer Webster tōku ingoa, nō ngaitarangi ngā pui mā ngāti wai a hau, uh, nō reira tēnā koutou. Um, I am a trustee of a Māori health and social service provider in Te Puke, and I'm also a lawyer by trade, and, and I'm definitely not a prince. <laughs> <laughs> Kia pai, thanks, Spence. Um, and kia ora everyone and thank you for uh, logging in and um, listening to our korero tonight. Um, Anna, did you just want to do a quick, um, another quick korero in terms of who you are and then we'll jump over to Hannah to open up our um, korero and set the foundation for what we're going to be discussing tonight. Yeah, sure. Kia ora anō whānau. Uh, ko Anna Rolleston tōku ingoa nō tauranga mōna hau. Um, I'm Anna, I'm Managing Director here at Manawa Order, the Centre for Health. Um, mostly 
uh, working in the research space, space these yeah. days and not so much in the clinic space. So kia ora. Kia ora, Anna. All right, Hannah, um, do you want to set the platform for our kōrero tonight? Um, and let's have a kōrero about why mental health is so important in these days and times, but also what effect it has on our bodies. Mm, yeah, um, certainly not an easy answer um, to give, or, um, and we all know that how complex mental health is. Um, mental health, I, I guess, encompasses emotions, feelings, behaviours, um, and affects every aspect of our physical wellness as well. Um, we cannot ignore our mental health, um, and nor should we. And I think every single one of us needs to acknowledge the impact that the way we feel, the emotions that we hold, um, and then equally what we do about them is going to have a direct impact impact on our physical health um, and what we're able to achieve day to day and within our lives as well. Um, so I guess, yeah, here talking particularly to these two amazing people, um, you can see Spencer's head increasing. Um, it's awesome to get different perspectives as well because for everyone, um, mental health issues can be brought on by different things, whether that be trauma, um, being a pretty massive one, um, can just be the accumulation of little things throughout life that eventually gnaw away at us, um, or it could just be a really difficult time in life, um, which is particularly prominent at the moment with everyone's lives being so busy, being so um, chaotic, um, with a lot of uncertainties around at the moment as well. So taking the time to acknowledge where we're all at, what's going on around us and then how we could potentially be coping um, or doing things a little bit different um, to address what might be going on is going to help with our physical health as well as our mental health. Yeah. Um, and so Anna, that kind of leads us into our first part. I, what are the common mental health issues people are dealing with nowadays? So um, it's, it's funny because the term mental health has got lots of different meanings to different people based on their own experiences, either of themselves or within their whānau. But I suppose if you're talking about for um, the majority of us, as Hannah said, we've all got mental health and we've all got emotions and feelings and um, thoughts that sometimes take over our lives. And so it's about thinking about what's common for most people. And I think stress is the big one. So stress is a term that we often don't associate with actual mental health. Um, stress is something that like often we end up with some heart things, for example, when we have to go and see a doctor about it. But stress is one of the biggest drivers of mental health concerns because stress then leads to things like anxiety and depression, which become um, which can become clinical disorders. But just because we feel down or not that great doesn't mean that we have depression or anxiety, but we might have episodes of feeling depressed or having some anxiety. And so there's this continuum of kind of what, what's common. And if we think about anxiety and depression as kind of quite... Um, overarching words that can describe different ways that people feel stress in their bodies um, and thinking about sadness and depression which is a very low feeling and a low state and anxiety which is often a fast running kind of highly thinking state so these the difference between those two things and everything in between so it's quite difficult to kind of say what what is a common mental health concerns for people um, because we label them differently based on our experiences but it's really the difference between that fast 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 thing and the low low down thing um, and we can often find ourselves at different places along that continuum can we um wh what's everyone's thoughts in terms of um the acceptance of kind of talking about mental health nowadays. Do we think that that's moved on some? 
Spencer, did you have any focado on this in terms of um, maybe, um, you know, we've got some really loud advocates that are really good, like I'm thinking of JK, of Mike King, who are like strong um, advocates for mental well-being, but which has taken us some way forward to be able to discussing mental health and normalizing that. What what do you <coughs> on kind of how far we've come and how far we've still got to go? Uh, yeah, I probably best can convey my thoughts from a male perspective because uh, you know when I was growing up, uh, you know everything was about hardening up and not crying. You're certainly not about the sheer feelings and uh, and you know expressing your feelings for other men, that kind of thing. Uh, what I have noticed, and, and certainly in my generation, is that there's now a greater uh, openness about expressing your feelings, um, talking with each other about the challenges you have. So to me, the, the stigma that used to be applied to people who might indicate they were having a few mental health challenges has either well, maybe not gone away, but it's certainly decreased. And, and I do notice and say my 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 kids, uh, their, their friends and that kind of thing, they seem to be a heck of a lot more open about it where there's not that kind of uh, 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 view about what masculinity is uh, at, at, at those in the younger generation. So I certainly think it has changed in my lifetime where uh, I, I, from, from, you know, in, in the circle of friends I have, we're much more aware of it and much more aware of the need to be open about it and address it. Amazing. Does anyone else have any Fakaro on that particular kaupapa? Oh, Paya, were you going to say? Um, well, I, I can remember, <clears throat> I can remember uh, growing up and I was 12 years old and um, I didn't know that my mother was depressed and I didn't see it in any way, or shape or form in our house because we always had everything is normal, beautiful meals. Um, but she was actually diagnosed with severe depression and was sent away to Porirua for shock treatment, which was horrendous. And um, my dad had to take time off work to look after the kids. And that was my first experience of, gee, you know, does something, something that bad can go wrong to take your mother away? And I don't think that was a great experience, but we still never discussed it as a family, you know, in terms of... Um, like we 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 just, we just had to live with it because we weren't told about it um and and i think that's changed over the years too you're um more aware of discussing things discussing um things that, that happen within your family which it did for us mm. oh. i still um i've got a bit of a view on that because what we see here um with people coming through the center is um people don't know that they're they're on the edge or, or they're not seeing those signs that we talked about earlier. And there's, I think there's this little bit of still um, in Aotearoa where it's kind of like we're, we're all trying to be successful all the time and we're trying to, you know, make sure our family's well fed and well clothed and we've got a house and we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to just do all of these things that make it seem like we're successful. Um, and that is those those are the types of things that contribute to people's poor mental health because it, it's that perception that look at all these amazing people on the screen who seem to have excuse my language got their shit sorted um, whereas the but but that's just the perception of it and I think there's still a little bit of oh you know look at look at them over there the Instagram kind of um scenario where you look at someone's insta and they're just doing all these amazing beautiful things and you're like man i've got to work harder i've got to do more because that, that's not where i am i totally agree i totally agree with that um what um so okay so what is everyone's experiences with mental health or mental health um challenges Fire, did you want to um, share your whakaaro about your journey with mm. um, If you would like to share that, I think um, that's so Just beautiful. Travelling along, along my, um, my life path really well. 
Um, I got to 52. I had a regular mammogram um, and then found out I had breast cancer and I was the only one in my family. So it was like a bit of a shock. So I was coping with the diagnosis because, yeah, you know, what can go wrong? Um, and then it moved into actually it's quite serious. So you'll need to do chemo and radiation and so every day it just built up and it just built up and I thought I was coping, but I thought this is probably not going to be a good outcome. So I spent sort of like a next crazy few months um, taking videos of myself with all my grandchildren in case I wasn't around to have a future with them. And so I was slowly building towards a, a, a quite unstable sort of a insecurity and um I even like at the Cancer Lodge in, in, um, in Hamilton, even the name Cancer Lodge filled me with dread and I didn't want to go there. Um, uh, and I did. And I, I actually painted a series of paintings while I was there. But I'm saying this in hindsight, because at the time, I think I was experiencing extreme anxiety, but I'd never been depressed or anxious in my life before. And I had one incident when I was... Um, playing cards with the ch my children around the table and we were happily laughing and chatting and in, in an instant I felt like I was drowning it's like what's going on here and I could feel myself sinking inside my head and that I couldn't get out I couldn't get out of myself and um, I said to my daughter something's bad is really happening something bad's happening she said what's the matter I said I don't know I said get me to the hospital so we my husband and, and daughter took me to the hospital and the first thing the doctor said to me he said have you had some bad news recently and that was the first inkling that I knew that that I was okay but something else was happening in my life um, and I, they gave me antidepressants and I went home but that's happened twice again so I know that um, we're all um, we're all vulnerable and we can all have periods of of absolute craziness that we can't, can't account for it so I try and avoid that so we'll talk about, more about that later. Oh, thank you for sharing that with us Fire. Um, does anyone else have any whakaaro on the mental health journey? Spencer? Um, how long have you got? No. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh look yeah I think I, uh, I'm one of those ones that probably um, didn't really know what it was uh, until, you know, I was, you know, much older uh, in life. And so you sort of go along and you're not really sure what's happening. But um, I, I come from, I mean, I've been in the legal profession and it's, um, you know, quite an exacting uh, profession. Uh, burnout is a sort of regular thing. And I certainly suffered from that, but I didn't, re I didn't recognize it as burnout. I just assumed that's what everyone went through. and um, and so, yeah, I certainly struggled from a range of issues as a result of it. You know, over time, your your energy levels, your ability to function just declines. And, and sometimes it's, it's really bad. And then it leads to other things, uh, particularly your physical health suffers. So, yeah, I, I've certainly been through all of that kind of thing. And, and you know, had some, uh, you, you always get a sort of certain level of, anxiety or the low feelings that Anna talked about um, and so you go you're up and down and you're always just kind of on the roller coaster ride and and then you know it has impacts on your whānau relationships and and so on uh, so you've yeah, certainly been on, on that ride for a while. Thanks Spencer. What about um, Hannah or Anna when whānau or people come into the clinic and they don't really know what's going on. How easy is that to spot? Do you have um, clients that come in and um, kind of like what fire went through, not knowing what was happening to their tinana or mm -hmm. to everything, right? Because it's all connected. Um, and, you know, how often are you seeing that? How do you talk whānau through that? What yeah. there is in there? No, absolutely. And I mean, to be fair, majority of people, especially if they're coming in because, you know, they've just had a heart attack or just had a stroke, um, obviously they're so focused on the physical aspect, but um, very few, uh, some do, but few don't acknowledge the impact that it's also having on their mental health um, and the fact that they've, because they've been through this huge trauma, effectively, they've withdrawn a lot from um, the things that bring them joy in the day 
Um, but even before we get to that point, it's for a lot of people that are coming in for, I guess, more of an, a preventative aspect. Um, so perhaps they're coming in because they've had a friend or a whānau member who's had a heart attack and they just want to check things out for themselves. And then we sit down and actually talk about everything that's going on in their life. Um, always somehow try and draw in the mental health aspect and usually it's through a conversation around stress um, or their family or, or things that they enjoy during the day um, people yeah it can be a hard one to broach but then people as soon as they start acknowledging it noticing it um, we're fortunate here that we have some incredible clients who um, I guess create this incredible friendly welcoming environment to a lot of clients and so or to other people that are, are new and beginning and so make them feel welcome and make them feel supported and comfortable um, and that's certainly an environment that we try to foster um, they don't have to um, give away any information or details about themselves but um, it, it is an area that's really important for us as clinicians to be able to understand where they're at and to be able to provide that support for them. We kind of joke that, um, you know, we're exercise physiologists, but our side our side job is actually a psychologist or a counsellor. Um, I think we spend almost half our time just listening to people um, so that they can talk. And for a lot of people, we're the first ones that they've actually had the opportunity to discuss um, openly some of these issues with. Um, and so I feel very privileged that um, people feel comfortable enough to discuss those things with us. Um, and then obviously it's it's of importance for us to be able to support them and make sure that they get the help that they need. Um, yeah, I can't even remember what the question was, but that about it. <laughs> yeah. um, Spence, I just want to jump back to you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I want to jump back to you because you organised you organised a workshop for a group of mates. Can you just can you just explain what you did and why you did that and how it came to be? Okay, um, yeah. Well, I I had this idea, a really simple idea, that I'd get four or five of my mates. We'd come and see Hannah and Anna, and they'd tell us how bad we were, and then we'd set a program for dealing with what we were. You know, needed to address and then it kind of I'd, I'd spoken to them and they were like well actually why stop at us and let's go a bit further and um, so we've organized a couple of wānanga um, where we've got a few of us together and and we've heard from Anna and Hannah about you know what is really what is health and how do you deal with stress what is stress what impact does it have all those kinds of things and so we're just uh, working on the next um, session we're going to have and make it an ongoing thing where we actually sort of have these regular check-ins and then also add some health challenges to it as well, just to um, have some accountability in it. But what drove it was uh, firstly my own um, situation uh, in terms of the, the, the challenges I'd had. And I, I sort of over time realized that actually I, the, nothing I was experiencing was unique uh, and in fact it was probably more widespread than not and so I, I just had in my mind that you know I just didn't want one of us to have to go to each other's funeral prematurely um, and so we just decided to do something about it um, there was a, I, I was at a conference one time and um, you know you had the aftermatch function and I was talking to a lawyer, quite a high, pro high profile lawyer, and we're having a great old time, really good chat about our backgrounds, this kind of thing. And then I think within a week, uh, he had ended his life. Uh, and, and it struck home to me that I'm looking at a guy who by, uh, by outward appearances is one of the most successful people in our profession, good person, uh, but at the end of the day, had his own internal struggles and they were undiagnosed and I don't know who he had to turn to or not. And so I just thought that actually, and then I talked to a couple of friends and they had indicated that actually they were having some challenges and some were seeking help, which I thought was really awesome. And so, yeah, that the, the, the sort of momentum 
picked up from all of those events where I said, right, let, let's do something. It's time. Um, and I think, too, again, going back to that male thing, was that I, I was a bit uh, unsure about how it would be received getting a group of guys in a room to sort of share share things. And uh, it was really successful in the end. And, you know, so much so there's a lot of passion for it. Um, but, yeah, that, that's kind of, I think it was just time for us to have open and honest conversations about where we were and have a network that we could reach out to to share our issues or at least just talk to someone about any issues we were having and be there as to support the brothers um, with whatever they were going through. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're um, you know, it's, it's easy just to go through life and just keep putting in the hard yards and then neglect everything. And then, it, you know, you're getting to my age and all of a sudden the wheels start falling off real quick. So, um, yeah, it was just really a, a kind of initiative to try and do something about it. Um, we didn't know what we were doing, to be honest, but I went to Hannah and Hannah and they know what they're doing. So I figured, oh, that's a good start. So, so far, so good. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, what? So, uh, Hannah, you mentioned when clients come in, part of your role is to talk to them and to let them talk to you and to connect. And Spence, what I've just heard from you is that's exactly kind of when you guys get together, a big part of, a big part of that mental well-being is that connection component. Is, is, is that correct? Like being able to talk to someone, to reach out, to have those conversations. Is that what, is that something that you tell your mates when you catch up? You know, um, yeah. that I'm here for you. Um, has that changed over time since this Rupu has started? Yeah, I think it's I think it's part of our pathway to normalizing the conversation about it, and therefore uh, removing completely the stigma of it. Uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about sort of like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm just clicked over to the fifty, and uh, so most of my mates are in and around that age, and you know, to 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 a lot of the people in our profession, we're seen as kind of the the, the veterans and uh, the most experienced. And yet, you know, we're we're having the same issues that someone who's twenty five and thirty is, just without perhaps uh, the same physical ailments. But um, so yeah, I think it's it's just a step in that process to being open about where we are. And actually, part of it was. Yes, deal with us at our at our age, but actually we wanted to role model a different set of behaviors for the junior members of our profession that they could then take on and, and not go through what we went through, uh, where you know you were looked down upon if you ever, you know, mentioned that you were having any difficulties. And yeah, so we felt that if we were going out there and and acting and behaving in this way where we're being really open that would then encourage them to do it at a much earlier time and therefore hopefully we're then able to address the issues uh, at a much earlier time Bye. um so we've got a preventative corridor that i'm hearing from spencer fire june when you were going through your uh breast cancer journey um how that impact of, you know, how, how did that trauma impact your mental health? Were you able to, who were you two talking to? Was it easy for you, hard for you? How did you, you know, want people to reach out to you? Well, I didn't, I didn't actually think that I had a, uh, um, I didn't think that mentally I had a problem. I thought physically I had a problem. So um, when I was, um, having chemo and, and and feeling really, really tired. And I thought I could lie on the couch all day and feel rotten, or I could get up and go for a walk. Um, and I started walking and I didn't realize that um, your, what I did discover how, was how amazing your, your body is, that it will operate without you. You can be brain dead and your body will still be going, hey, let's go folks, you know, you'll, it will keep you alive. And I learned to um, trust my body more. And I would, I would, um, walk I'd walk you know um, quite long distances because uh, 
walking inadvertently puts endorphins into your system so that you're actually feeling good despite your mental health you're actually feeling better about yourself so the more I trusted my intuition about how my body was feeling the better I I, I got and and um, coping with the other things was um uh, when I'm anxious, I can't breathe and I, I get breathless and my, my voice becomes, you know, it's because I'm trying to suck in as much air as I can and that, that's just a coping device. Um, and, and that's the feeling that I get when I'm, um, you know, quite panicky. It's like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not breathing. But so meditation has been really good, like literally holding, breathing and holding your breath and then just letting the air out slowly meditation sounds great because it, it, it has so many benefits but it's one of the hardest things you do because you're um, letting thoughts go and that's really hard because you're sitting there in this beautiful space and you're trying to get into the zone and you're thinking I wonder what we're going to have for dinner tonight <laughs> that, that um, just keep crowding in your brain and you keep saying go away go away and you get into the zone again and, and it's like oh that washing did I finish that or did I so it's it's really really difficult so I praise people that 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 do meditation because I know how how can you meditate for three hours I mean I can hardly do it for three minutes no I've really actually learned to do it really well um but one of the things that was healing for us was that well for me was that after you've had a um a pretty serious diagnosis the medical system lets you go because you've had chemo and radiation off you go and off they you know and then you're out there going what next what do I do now how do I not get it how do I get cancer how do I not get it so um I decided that people were the way that people were the way that I was going to um heal and it was getting in touch with people with this with the same things that I was going through and not just breast cancer any any thing that affects your mental health has an impact on everything you do so uh, we formed the other ticker cancer trust um and our um, healing programs are amazing and it's about uh meditation um uh and integrating all of the things that you know about I I did things like I clutched out everything that would work for me I did rongoa I would go to tohunga if you said to me Nat I will heal you I'd say well place your hands on me and heal me now everything that I could do to get well um, and I realized that I was actually quite desperate because I was in, in a situation where I didn't know what my outcome was going to be you know so I'm I, I call myself a morihua survivor that you know like um, 20 years later I'm still here and I I'm thankful every day for that but it's coping with the small things daily. It's like going for a walk or, or, or meditating or slowing down or breathing properly or um, because things happen to you anyway, things happen in your life and they're all bound to stress you out. And I mean, if you've got children, you know that <laughs> <laughs> in one form or another. So it's learning how to, um, how, how it will affect you and how, what you have to do to get yourself better too. And that's like what there's some amazing techniques there, like breathing. I think we all underestimate how important breathing is. And I, I know I've said it uh, on our corridor before, but um, yeah, just being able to regulate that and bringing yourself down is so incredibly important. What other strategies can you, you know, we've heard about breathing. Um, meditation I agree with you fire it's incredibly tough especially for a busy 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 brain um, what other strategies can like do you guys have to um, to support your mental well-being Hannah what do you do well for me personally it's exercise um, for me it's getting outside well and yeah getting outside into the bush or next to the ocean and exercising and um for me that's just my happy place it makes me feel good um exercise and I mean um if I nailed it exercise releases endorphins those happy dolphins in your brain it will actually make you feel better even just after a single session um no one is ever not happy that they did an exercise that they did exercise um, and I love that saying as well, that exercise is the most underrated antidepressant um, or underutilized antidepressant um, because it has such significant impacts um, on not only our mental health, but use it enough, do it frequently enough, um, and you can change a lot um, about your overall health. 
And I guess it's the like the little things like fire you were saying with the breathing and the mindfulness, it's doing little things every day that are changing your normal cycle. And unfortunately with mental health, you can end up in this tunnel doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it can feel like you're trapped in this dark hole with no way out. But having little wee things that you can do, um, even if it's just three breaths, even if it's just listening to a little um, guided meditation on your phone, whether it's just someone dragging you out the door to go for a little walk, something that just breaks your normal routine um, and having those in place so that they can happen regardless of what's going on around you. Um, sometimes that can involve having incredibly supportive people around you or it can require a lot of willpower on your own, but having those little routines or little things that you can do, um, doesn't matter what it is, but something that makes you um, not necessarily feel good in the moment, but is going to do good for you later on. Yeah. And when you say exercise to even a walk is, you know, it doesn't have to be high impact, stressful on the body, but going for a walk, um, yep. like Fire was saying, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, just doing, moving your body is going to have a physiological impact um, and it will help improve your mental state. Um, and then obviously the key is to start doing it frequently and then you can slowly start increasing the intensity and those benefits will just keep climbing um yeah yeah Spencer um, we've had a couple of comments about you meditating already mate from our whānau watching at home yeah 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 well it's nearly, it's nearly my bedtime but um uh, look, I, I think there are other things I, I would add. I, I look, what Hannah's saying is that kind of time out. Um, you know, I certainly think we need to pause on the busyness of our lives sometimes. That's certainly something I do. Uh, another one I've taken to, and, you know, uh, uh, probably five years ago, I wouldn't have ever mentioned this, but now I do, but is uh, things like affirmations. Um you know, uh, in the morning. I mean, I even wrote some this morning after um, I went through a workout, um, you know, just to kind of remind yourself, you know, what you're good at, keep some good uh, uh, positive talk in your own mind to uh, sort of counter the negative talk that you can have, which sometimes leads to the spiral into anxiety and uh, and so on. So that, that certainly uh, is a technique I've used. Mm. Anna? So my thing tends to towards the fear and anxiety side of things and what I find is something I, I need to get myself out of that cycle I need to ground I need to find something to ground myself and it can be as simple so if it's at work and I um, um, and I'm not I know I'm not coping um, or I'm just super stressed I'll just take my shoes off and go and stand on the wet grass yeah. um, so and, and that for some reason just completely clears my mind and I can just kind of reset myself and start thinking differently if um, I've had episodes in my life where I've had significant anxiety to the point where um, like in the middle of winter I've been in a cold sweat in the middle of the night and had to go and lie outside with hardly any clothes on on the deck to try and cool down and get my heart rate down and things like that and actually I find um, water water is really helpful in that in that acute trauma state when you've got a significant thing happening to you and you need to try and control it um, I found water was really helpful so even just like a cold flannel on your face, but actually getting, in, if it was conducive to get into the water, like actually go and jump into something cold, for some reason that, for me, bring, brings me down and out of that fizzing state. So um, other people who are listening might have things that they know that, that automatically in an instant kind of brings them out of something and just having that thing on hand or, um, when you go into situations that you know are triggers for you feeling the awful way that you don't like feeling, 
having those things on board. I tried rescue remedy and things like that at one point, but for me, those things didn't work. I, I don't think they were enough of a jolt to make a difference. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my experience. I've got um, someone watching has just said, I found that interpersonal communication, so self-talk, is an actual thing and once learning that the stigma of having a quiet conversation with myself is okay so just having that internal cord at all kind of what you were saying too Spence so that affirmations um so thank you for your feedback Vano. um on that interpersonal talk thing I reckon that's a really I reckon that's all of our problem eh is the chitter chatter and the voice in your head that says you're not good enough and that you're hopeless and who the hell do you think you are doing this thing that you're doing um and all of that stuff and I think um knowing that that's what your mind does is one thing for people who are trying to manage their own mental wellness is knowing that that's normal that that's what our brains do because once you know it's normal you don't get so it's kind of like, oh, look, here I am again. Like, here it is again. And then you can start putting strategies in place. But that kind of message that we all do that and our minds are geared to do that. So it's just like like Spencer was saying, those, those affirmations are helpful because that's otherwise your mind rolls on and rolls on. And also that we all do it. And it's not so isolating. You know, we all have those, oh, God, thoughts that we can't do it so having those positive things kind of keeps that rubbish at bay it gives us that kind of wall something more positive to focus on I totally agree so can we how can we identify stresses as a mindfulness practice guys how do we identify them what are they Fire, do you do you know when you're triggered or like what do you feel what what how do you know when you're getting stressed other than that feeling of drowning is that how you yeah well actually when Spencer was talking before and he talked about spiraling what it reminded me of was um te koro koro a te parata which is the spiral that nearly um turned our waka and, and as we were coming over at the oceans we nearly got into that spiral and never got out of it and that's exactly how I felt I was spiraling into a drowning that that was happening before my eyes that I I didn't have um and that had never happened to me before so um when I I sort of recognize it's usually it's usually round about um a health thing like um yeah um so you know when something serious is happening to your body and it actually as Spencer said it happens a lot more as you get older there's just things that fall off every day and <laughs> <blow up. laughs> right. you know, whatever you know and so um I, I talked about it with my daughter the other day and I said I, you know like I'm having trouble remembering this this waiata and she said mum actually it starts quite early your brain cells start dying like in your 20s you know they just, just so, so that worries me that I'm just seeing all this you know I'm looking at a wake of brain cells or just pouring out of my body um but it's actually relearning things which is in terms of doing things that are good for me um and I try and look I look for joy every day and it might be a cup of coffee it might be seeing a muko it might be but it's one thing that I I strive for and um it's like that first step to good health um if I know that I've got something at the end of the day, like even a, a lovely kai with your family, or um, it's keeping things joyful in your future that you work towards. Um, and that's what I do to um, try and mitigate the, the effects of, and it doesn't happen all the time, but I know when it does. And, um, and the nights are the hardest for me um, because my mind just works overtime and then I'm not breathing. And then I have to sit up in bed and, turn the tv on or distract myself um, to stop the um the repercussions of anxiety which is my heart beating my cortisol floods my system it's like a um you know and I get and I have anxiety so but it's not a thing that I um that ruins my life it's just something that I'm aware of and I try and mitigate that whatever it might be and it's like walking into the forest or you know um 
and and painting was a good thing for me to do too because you're drawing on the right side of your brain so you're actually unaware of things while you're painting you can listen to music you can um and so painting was a good out for me so anything that you do that's a physical hobby that you enjoy is is one way too of mitigating um the anxious um, effects of life using creativity something that you love doing fire um anyone else Mm -hmm. well I think your your question was about um stresses how you how you how you know that you're heading down that path um and I think fire you're right often it comes as a physical thing so a pain a yucky feeling um a heart tremor a breathing changes something like that um but I also think it's behavior when other people usually tell you you're not your usual self so you might be a bit grumpier than usual or um mm. you you might react in a in a different way to a situation that you're always in so behavior changes are also a, a sign they, they're not that i'm there yet i'm you know I'm, I'm having an episode but they're a sign that you're on your on your way to that you know those little things are the things that you pick yourself up on and you're like why am I doing that you know why you know am I, so when you when your partner says to you man you're grumpy today and instead of just going oh no I'm not it's like sitting with that and going am I and and if I am why is that and what's going on and and just having that space to have that conversation with yourself to reflect because so often we don't like being told that we're acting badly um and, and it's something that we want to push away, just go, no, we're not. But actually, if it is a sign, then we should sit with that and try and figure it out so that we can deal with it now instead of like in two weeks' time when it's built up and built up and it becomes something else. Especially from our partners, our lesser halves, Anna. That's especially <laughs> triggering when it's the other halves telling us that we're grumpy. I don't know about anyone else, but just for me. Never been grumpy in my life, Matt. Exactly. I don't know what you're talking, what are you talking about? about. Fun and the fun. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. What's this? Okay, guys, what's the relationship between, we've just spoken about, um, you know, nighttime activities and when that's kind of come on. What's the... Um, What's the relationship between sleep and mental health? Massive. Well, sleep is when our mental health has the opportunity to recover and regenerate and restore. And unfortunately, when our mental health is not great, sleep can also be hard to come by. And it creates this really vicious cycle. Our sleep is, um, is cyclical. So a sleep... Um, phase lasts around 90 minutes to two hours and it incorporates what we call deep sleep which is when our physical body recovers and REM sleep which is when our mental health recovers and we get the most of our REM sleep um, sort of between usually between 3 to 5 a.m when our environment is typically coldest and darkest and typically that's when a lot of people who suffer from mental health issues are wide awake um, and so therefore the mental health or our, our minds are not getting the opportunity to recover um, and to look after themselves. And so part of that is, is looking at your daily routines, it's looking at your evening routines, and then it's also looking at what you're doing when you wake up as well. Um, looking at bright screens and turning lights on is, is the worst thing you can do. Um, whereas getting up in the morning, getting outside into the fresh air, into the daylight um, and connecting with your environment as well is so important to help re-kick your circadian rhythm, to help your body produce its own melatonin. Um, but then also, like we've talked about, doing things that are going to help relax your body during the day, such as mindfulness, breathing, um, you know, connecting with what makes you happy. When you get into bed at the end of the day, your body's going to know how to relax and switch off. But if you don't show it what that looks like during the day, how on earth can you expect it to do it um, straight away at night? So the actions, the things that we do throughout the day, um, the way that we allow our bodies to wind down and start relaxing in the evenings, 
um, and then equally what we do first thing in the morning are all going to help with that sleep and ensure that we're getting the physical recovery as well as the mental recovery when we sleep. And unfortunately, it's not an overnight fix. You actually have to work at it um, for days, weeks, months, sometimes. Years. Um, years, yeah, yeah. Slowly. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, the sooner you start, the better, yeah. So what I'm hearing is if you're in that kind of cycle at the moment and you're not getting enough sleep, changing your routine to something that's more conducive to that even though you might wake up in the morning and feel horrible and get get dragging yourself out of bed we all know that the hardest thing is to actually get out and get out and do a walk or do a run or do whatever but once you come back you know yeah how much better you feel for it no matter how tired you were before yes so um that's awesome does anybody have anything else to add to that for one of the um, things that really um, worked well, has been working well um, for me personally, is actually um, taking note of maramataka and how the moon affects, the moon cycles affect our body. And it's um, great to know when the high energy day, days are there because you know that you can actually extend yourself and, and do things. And the low energy days are really important too because you know, don't push yourself or look at, so it's it's actually being aware of environmental um um, changes um, which are to do with the science of, of the phases of the moon so I found that really helpful um, mm. just knowing just having a calendar that says oh well you know you've got to do your wānanga or do your high painting high activity stuff during the phase of and that's usually uh, aligned with the planting cycle and um, you know when, when energy is there so you put all your plants in at that time so when our parents used to do the um, the gardening by the moon it actually is the same for your um, physical okay. and mental health as well and that's been a really good learning for me yeah i've been blaming a lot of things on the moon lately yep. um <laughs> and, the, and, is the, the, and is the maramataka queen around here because wow. you feel like if you feel awful when you walk in the door you go and see hannah and she's like oh well it's just it's because it's like, okay <laughs> <laughs> we're in this space yeah um and i guess the other thing as well which we haven't mentioned and it's it's a physiological aspect is hormones because mm. in um it affects men as well but just thinking particularly for women both pre-menopause and perimenopause or women when you're in high hormone phase it does affect your mental health because it's affecting you physiologically on so many different levels and so many women in particular when they're in high hormone phase will feel the most anxiety they will have the highest levels of depression during that phase um, and in recognizing what is actually going on in your body and being able to say oh actually I'm feeling so overwhelmed at the moment and I'm dropping everything and I'm feeling like a right klutz it's not because it's my fault it, actually it's because I'm in high hormone phase sometimes just acknowledging that and being aware of that can help with the coping of it too and you can also come in the strategies and know okay during that week I'm not going to organize anything that requires too much effort on my part because I know I'm not going to be there um, 100% so sometimes just being away being aware sorry of your physiology and what what's happening to you in different phases can be really helpful as well that goes for you too Spencer mm. you're up <laughs> uh fire we've just had a um Simone's just uh, messaged in and said, uh, Kia ora fire, I love that uh, when you were talking about finding joy. So looking for joy in my day, my mukul fills my cup up and helps me refocus on being happy when I've had a tough day, sitting and colouring with him and my mukul. So kia ora fire, beautiful for cuddle. Um, how can we support a loved one with mental health issues, Fano? How do we... Fire, when you were going through um, your journey, how did you need help or how did you want help? How did you want your friends or whanau to connect with you? Did you? Um, I was actually probably quite introverted. I didn't really want to um, to see a lot of people. And it was, it was, and it was depression probably. Um, but I just needed my family and I needed to be around them. And, and um, I probably talked a hell of a lot because I was trying to pass on everything that they needed to know. It was like, these are my last days. What do I, what do they need to know? 
Um, and so I spent, it probably took a year to come out of that um, trying to heal my body cycle. It was, and it was the ravages of it's losing your hair. It's, you know, when I think about how unimportant that is, but at the time it was actually quite important, you know, to be totally bald, have no eyebrows um, and your feelings about yourself. You know, you, you're not the person that you think you are. Um, and so you you hide away. And um, I think that does uh, certainly affect people when they, and it's probably especially women when they know they're losing their hair. Um, but in the end, I decided how unimportant that was. Um, but but it was just, I mean, some of, the, some of the things, I mean, I got a really, really nice wig. And um, I met a friend in town that I hadn't seen for a while. And he said, oh, I've, I've heard about your journey. I'm really sorry. And he threw his arms around me and, and, and hugged me. And my wig slipped back and my bald head was sort of peered out of the front. And he was horrified that he'd like, it was just so awful for him. And it was actually quite hilarious. But I mean, those, <laughs> those are the things that, um, that, you know, that's what I realized. It doesn't matter. I could have walked around with my hair. And, and that's what I love about um as it happens now, people are shaving their heads for their friends, you know. Um, so, yeah, life isn't about how you look, really. Mm -hmm. But you have to come to that <laughs> conclusion mm -hmm. to yourself. You know, you have to do that for yourself. But, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Identity is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Like, w with everything, like, in terms of how you perceive yourself, you know, how you want to go out. Um, how, how, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's an interesting one, Fire. Mm -hmm. um, Spencer? Um, yeah, yeah oh, look, I, I guess, um, you know, no, ju no judgment involved. Um, I mean, we're probably, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just the, the way I was brought up and the generations before me were all very much, you know, if there's an issue, you deal with it, you know, and, you know, it's not quite that simple. And so, you really just you can't judge them for what they're going through number one and number two i guess you you, you got to be there for them uh, unconditionally and help them find out when they're ready to get it um that's that's kind of my approach to it and how has that gone through like you with your with your mates at Opu, in terms of have you been able to court it all with them around their mental health around what's going on in their lives so yeah to talk you know yeah look i think now you know if you if you talked amongst our group that you'd gone to see a psychologist um you know there would have been a time when you know your manlyhood would have been uh, well allegations would have been made about um you know which which for the side of the fence you were on but uh <laughs> nowadays if you say it I don't, I don't think in fact if anything you, you you're more likely to get full support for you having done that and actually a kind of, I think, some respect that you had the guts to go and seek help when you needed it. So, you know, I said, oh, that, that's the kind of dynamic I'm seeing right now. Hmm. And I, I think another aspect as well, and this is from personal experience, but also from working with obviously people going through it, is those that are the carers. So those that are the ones that are looking after someone with mental health it's ensuring that you yourself are actually also looking after yourself because it can be incredibly difficult and hard and it wears you down to no end trying to support someone with a mental health issue, um, particularly if it, if it is a fairly ongoing and severe one, um, you yourself end up in a pretty dark place as well. So, you know, they say on the plane you have to, give yourself the oxygen before you can help someone else and you have to remember that too that sometimes if you want to help someone else you have to make sure that you're also supporting yourself and doing the things that are going to help your own mental health in order to be able to give the support and the full attention that that other person needs as well yeah and I also think that um, mental health is not something that you can see in terms of uh you know you look as if you've got something wrong with you when you've when you've got a bald head people know that you've you've had some sort of and they're instantly empathetic and um are sorry for you but that doesn't happen when you look okay and that's just, you know what's wrong with you you look okay mm. you know you look okay 
And that's one of the difficulties with um, carrying something like depression or um, not coping with life and that, because you look all right, you're walking along and you're doing all the, it, like Spencer said, you're being the best you can be in your job. Um, nobody knows the turmoil that's going on in your head. Um, and that's the hardest thing to sort of like, are you okay? You know, you need someone to see you being different to recognize that there actually is something going on. So mm -hmm. I don't know how we look for those signs, but you know that with your friends anyway, or your family. You know, when somebody's not coping because you can, their behaviors are different. And, um, but sometimes there are people that are stoically out there, um, continuing to be the best they can be, having huge anxiety. So, kia tupato, you know, look at, look out for those ones. Beautiful. So, and so, um, it's time to wrap up now, Fano, but what if there's one piece of advice before we go? Um, and fire, you may have just said it, but if there's one piece of advice that you could impart to Fano watching at home for your um, to better their mental health, what would it be? Um, to be mindful, I I, I try and um, be kind as much as I can, um, and I think that and and being non-judgmental, as Spencer was saying too, it's actually pulling back on all the things that have been put into our heads from children growing up. We know what what it uh, feels like to be loved and nurtured. Um, put that out there. So I and I try and be a better person every day if I can, um, and that hasn't changed. So that's it. Atahua. Hannah. Yeah, that's a hard one. I've completely changed what I was going to say. Um, I think it's find something that you enjoy and do it frequently. And hopefully that thing that you enjoy is also actually good for you. Um, <laughs> but if it's, I was, I was going to say, you know, make sure you've got your next holiday booked before the next one ends. But I think we all need to take a break every now and then to actually realize where we're at and kind of take stock of, of what's going on. And so sometimes actually we need to take a step back. We need to go and whether that's put a fishing line out, just take some time, go for a walk on the beach, um, you know, do something that you enjoy, that grounds you, um, that allows you a bit of time to think about where you're at and what's going on in your life. Um, and if that happens to be on a tropical island for a week, that's all good. Um, you know, but make sure you, you, you take the time to do it and you do it frequently. Love it, you know. Spencer? Um, yeah, well, I had two things, and, you know, as with age, one's dropped off already, but uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I would say we, we've talked a lot about mental health and physical health, uh, and, and one of the things I think you need to look at is what, what's the status of your relationships in your life, the key ones, uh, and also what is the rest of your environment like uh, and and is that having an impact on your 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 mental well-being and and you know in professions and careers um you know you need to understand like what in my everyday life is causing me to have these stressors because it's one thing to be mindful and meditate and that kind of thing but then you're walking straight back into the conditions that are causing the the issues requiring you to get out in the first place. And so to some extent, you need to do a stock take on uh, where you're at as a, as a, with your family, where you're at in your work and other things that are impacting on your well-being. Love it, Spencer. So simple, yet so profound. Anna? Um, I suppose my take home is um, check in with your mate. So um, both Spencer and Fire have, have kind of touched on that um, I, idea that you might look all right on the outside, but on the inside, you're not all right. And this conversation has been about the fact that we've all got emotions and we've all got thoughts rolling around in our heads. So actually those people who you might think are good, check in on your mate. So, to, and it's just that question, are you okay? How's life? at the moment you know what's going on is there anything is there anything you know that's that's not kosher at the moment that you want to have recorded or about stuff mm. oh, kia ora. well kia ora and thank you to all of our panel tonight again um some beautiful insights and i hope our whanau at home was able to 
listen in, learn, and um, feel the aroha that this panel has um, given to our whānau. So, Homari Fano, thank you to everyone on here tonight, and uh, we'll see you next month um, for our next Hawaii Report. It all. Homari. Homari.